Scrum. A welcome to the Saturday Scrum. Doing it all here at Triple M thanks to King G Workwear. A, uh, a bit different looking Saturday Scrum today. Emma Lawrence stepping in for the great Tony Squires. So Wade Graham, Michael Chamis and Ryan Girdler. It's Thanks for letting you, me uh, step in. We missed you on the Thursday scrum this week. Adam Peacock jumped in. so Did you miss me? I did miss you, so it's yeah. good to have you here on Sunday. I was a little bit sick, had a bit of a flu during the week, so but I've recovered in time. But we've got to tackle the big issues first. Your young blokes. Yeah. We're proud. Playing first game of footy for your... Both of them. Both of them. Both of them. So we, i got a four-year-old and a six-year-old, and um, we, we wanted to split them up because the four-year-old was always going to play once we started our eldest, and... Um, so he's in the sevens, our oldest, and the young blokes in the sixes, and they had their first game of footy today. And I was on the sideline, um, proud dad moment. <laughs> I didn't realise how much I would enjoy it, but just seeing them get out there and have fun and run around, smiling in their face, yeah, it was a real proud dad moment this morning. Tag, tackle, what's the go? Tag, they play league tag. Um, Your kids don't tag, mate. I can well, see that yeah. already. Well, there's this one playing in the sevens. He, he has five weeks to tag. They do the tackle program and, and yeah. turns in the tackle. But yeah, we need to pull him back a bit. Like, <laughs> he's been watching the footy since, well, forever, right? He'd come yeah. on the field, he wants to play, he wants to be Ronnie Mortalo scoring tries and making tackles. So, um, no, it was, I was actually surprised how much fun I had and how much I enjoyed it. Wait, 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 I would imagine there'd be a fair bit of tackle technique happening in your backyard these days, right? Mate, those two boys, if they it's not, mix it up, do they out the back? Yeah, for sure. And so, my wife's French Canadian. They play ice hockey on Sunday mornings, and, <laughs> and that is like skates full padded up, and that's probably rougher than the footy. So, and how do they skate? Is that has that been something they've been doing for a long time, or they've just started that as well? Well, that's it. that's how it started because when we go home, all their cousins ice skate right in the winter. We normally go there at Christmas, and that's what, just what they do. So we, we we put them into the ice skating so they could learn. When we get over there, they're already behind in the French language, so we didn't want them to be behind in just the basic playing with their cousins and that. And then they just got better. They, they skated for probably 12 months. And now there's a little peewee team they play in the under nines and they just mix all the kids up and they have the little goals. It's, it's pretty cool because it's just something so different than, than what I had growing up. So going to the ice rink on a Sunday morning is um, pretty interesting. What if they mm. get to the point they have to, they're really good at both and they're teenagers and they have to choose between ice hockey or say the NRL. Like, can they make a lot of money in ice hockey? Oh, that's, there's a lot of water to go under the bridge yeah, there. Yeah, but, but, you know, just but think about him trying to leverage yeah, the, the yeah, kids already. Yeah, right. that's what, I always think you'd want to put your kids into golf or tennis so they can <laughs> travel the world, make lots of money. You can retire and they can pay for you to travel the world too. <laughs> That'd be the dream. So let's, yeah. we've got two, two chances at it. So we'll, we'll see how we go. <laughs> and Chami, the big issue for you, the under sixes are doing video sessions out at where? Oh, there's just a bit of talk out in the Penrith competition at the moment. Some of the... Clubs are doing video sessions with the under sixes. Wow. That's how serious that, they're taking that's a it. G up. No, it's I do, I'm set. not sure if I believe that under club. sixes have, have video sessions. It would have to be St. Mary's. I'm not, I'm Saint not Saint naming sure. names, mate. Come I'm a journalist. We don't give up our sources. Saint but Mary's, yeah, it was St. Mary's. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> St. Mary's. And how do your young blokes go? Yeah, I've got one has just left rugby league, unfortunately, going to soccer. One in, in rugby league at the moment, under sixes. So young Jacob's got five tries today. Doesn't get it from his dad, I can tell you that much. So. It's uh, it's exciting. It's a it's a real proud moment watching us, as Wade said, just watching them play, have some fun. And uh, for you, Gerds, yeah, how's your weekend been up there? What do you have to report from the great Sunshine State? Um, big big um, big game last night up here, like full uh, capacity crowd, obviously at uh, at Suncorp. So lots of energy in Brisbane when you come down for the local derby. That's turned into um, just a real event. Um, so I went down and, and sat in the back and watched that after the game that I called with the Storm and the Bulldogs, which is a, a really good contest. So, yeah, not much. My, I got two girls, so they don't play. That they, they they do some horse riding if we're doing the family thing. I go down and watch them. They jump some. They jump some. Um, I don't know what you call them, barriers or logs or whatever, and they like to um, ride horses and do some dancing. So my weekends are very different to the boys that you're sitting there with. <laughs> Well, we've got, um, we'll dive into the footy very shortly after the break, but just quickly, uh, some of the charges have come out. Chami, there were plenty put on report for two epic games last night. We had the Storm and the Bulldogs, which went down to the wire and the Dolphins as well. So looks like most of them have escaped with fines.
Yeah, the big one was Ryan Pappenhausen for that hip drop on uh, Josh Adokar. He has been charged, Ryan Pappenhausen. It's a grade one dangerous contact. He'll get away with a, a $750,000 fine. Oh, oh, really? That might be a bit wow. of a problem for Ryan Pappenhausen. But yeah, he uh, he's free to play next week. The only one who will miss some footy is Anthony Milford for that late shot. Well, the shot off the ball on Reese Walsh. He'll he'll be hit with a two-game ban three if he fights and loses. So well, I'm, I'm not whole... surprised, though, with, with Ryan Pappenhausen, given... Mm. Victor Radley the week before. It's getting so. I think the the, walk, the water seems to be getting pretty murky these days with that chamo. I mean, those one on one situations where there's obviously no intent behind them. There's accidents in the game, and I don't know. I, the, it just seems to be getting more confusing as to what is a hip drop and what isn't. When that actually gets identified as one, and when it doesn't. And sometimes now you'd feel like just falling on the back of the legs of a player is going to be a penalty. It's 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 becoming um, quite a sensitive issue in the game. Do you think the players are confident? Well, what is and isn't a hip drop? Yeah, well, you, well, I found in my last year because I used to do it quite a bit, not as in a hip drop, but if if you're not strong enough and you can't take the guy down, you actually use your body weight as leverage to pull mm. the person down, and you you just fall to the ground. I, I had a couple of concerning act like acts sent out from the NRO, and it was something you actually. Had to think about in the game. You, you can't do that no more. And, and we've seen guys use that technique um, in the past. Like Paddy Carrigan's had a couple of issues over the past, and that was a technique that he used. And he, and he's had to change his um, tackling style to adjudicate it. But I agree with Gerd. I feel like we got to this point last year where it got a bit murky about what was a hip drop and what wasn't a hip drop, and then we cleaned it up towards the back end. I just feel like we've gone sort of into the gray area again and maybe mm. just a couple of clear definitions of what is and what isn't because the Victor Radley one was, was no shot of a hit. It was just, well, I don't, I don't think that the match review committee and the referees are on the same page because last week, Victor yeah. Radley was sent to the bin for 10 minutes for that tackle. I think it was on Stephen Crichton and he wasn't charged by the match review mm. committee this week. Ryan Papin was obviously charged, but even that incident on the weekend with Lindsay Collins, remember, remember they, um, Remember Jacob, Jacob Saifidi that hit him high and they called captain's challenge, right? And it was it went upstairs and they said, there's no issue there, play on. That Jacob Saifidi was charged. The, the Roosters lost their challenge at a critical moment. I know they won. They lost their challenge at a critical moment. And now he's been charged with a, a, grade, one high, a grade one careless high tackle. So the match mm. review committee and the referees are definitely not on the same page at the moment. Well, I was calling that game and I couldn't believe it because the bunker actually said there is minimal contact to the head. Right in our game, there's no contact to the head, yeah. so that, that's a penalty for him to say there's minimal contact to the head. Yeah. It's it was a blatant penalty. Yeah. yeah. Here we go. Well, you might get stuck into them this week, then, will you, Chammy? No, no, I don't do that. No, I'm a nice guy. You're a nice guy. We've well, been getting stuck into South or uh, stirring <laughs> up a little bit of trouble at South, so we'll get into that very shortly. But after the break, we're going to talk the Broncos' epic win over the Dolphins, 28 to 14 in the Battle of Brisbane. Back to the Saturday Scrum, rocking your Saturday here at Triple M, thanks to King G Workwear. And I tell you what, the Broncos were rocking Suncorp Stadium last night, a sold-out Suncorp Stadium, or close to it. There are about 46,000 fans up there. As they got the job done, 28-14 to 14 over the Dolphins. Uh, Gerds, what did you make of that performance from the Broncos? Missing still a number of key players and... Didn't get off probably to the best start, but eventually had enough class to get the job done. Yeah, it was a, there was a lot of build-up up here through the week, and I thought they delivered in the first half. Both teams that sort of went went at it. It wasn't they, neither side was probably as clinical as they would have liked, but you know there was lots of intent with their defence, the ball running, and yeah, the Broncos. I just thought you know just always had that class, especially out wide when. Uh, unfortunately, the hammer got injured uh, midway through that first half and they lost him and without Farnworth, just starting to really sort of rip through their depth there at the Dolphins in some of those positions. And then I just sought the outside backs for the Broncos, the Cobos, Corey Oates, when he found his rhythm in the second half, Stags, Arthurs, they just started sort of taking opportunities. And there was a window there, I reckon, of about 15 minutes where the Dolphins just, you know, they looked a little disorientated with, you know, guys on there that... Um, were, were playing out of position and they came up with a couple of errors and the Broncos just pounced. I think Selwyn Cobbo, just a couple of opportunist tries and they kind of put the game to bed there. The Dolphins did well then to sort of come back and, and put some respectability in the scoreline because I, I thought the, you know, it, it, it was probably a 10 or, or 12 point victory from the Broncos in the end and, and it could have got out more and embarrassed the Dolphins. So I'm glad it didn't. 
But the Broncos, I just think, are on, um, what are they, three and three now? So they've had a pretty tough start to the season. They've played the Panthers, the Storm, the Cowboys, the Rabbits, the Roosters. So um, they've had some pretty good footy sides in front of them. And I think they're still finding their rhythm. And they're certainly not playing their best yet. But the fact that they're still sort of been able to scrap and win footy games, they've still got guys like Haas and Reynolds and that on the bench to come back. Um, I, I think they're, I think they're in pretty good shape. I, I think some of the young guys that are getting some footy under their belt now, um, through the origin period, it's going to be really beneficial. Um, yeah. And I think it's going to be, uh, the Broncos are shaping up or putting themselves in a, a position where they're going to have a real shot at the title this year. Yeah, I agree. I think in these times when you're, you're struggling with injuries and, and, you know, some of your key players out, are out like Payne Haas and, and Adam Reynolds, you just got to do what you have to do and get and get the win. And um, with those guys that come back, they'll keep improving their football. And, and Broncos got the job done last night. A couple of errors late from the Dolphins. And, you know, the Broncos are good enough to make him pay. It's such a big loss, the hammer, for, for the Dolphins. He, yeah. he, he's probably yeah. one of a handful of players in the NRL who, who can – not only he can do what he can do, yeah. his speed, the way he can just take half moments, half opportun uh, yeah. opportunities and turn them into points. And – He's yeah. such a strike weapon for that team. So a couple of injuries, but yeah, the hammer, it's a big blow for the Dolphins. So they're saying about, I think about a month for mm. the hammer. This is, we kind of started uh, the Dolphins, same thing happened last year, got off to a great start, Chammy, but then their depth, I know they've recruited better and they've been building, but their depth, once again, seems like it will be tested. Yeah, look, I think the, the ladder, it's a little bit of a false ladder at the start of the year because you look at the Dolphins' start. They beat the you know, the Cowboys in round one. I think the other wins have come against the Dragons and the Tigers, and they had a bye as well. So I was sitting at the top of the ladder, and I think last year the bubble burst around this point as well. They had some some injuries, and, and that's what's happened this time around. I I don't know if the Dolphins are, are a top eight team, but Wayne Bennett, you know, he'll he'll get them hanging around. With, with Brisbane, though, I think Gerd's hit the nail on the head. They've had a tough start. There's, there's been you know, travel, obviously, to, to Vegas. They've played the Panthers. They've played the Roosters. Now it starts to open up. They play the Raiders this week, and then after that, they'll play the Tigers, and sh they should get back Reynolds, Payne Haas, Piakura, Dean Mariner, and that's when they'll start their assault. That's when they'll start building towards getting themselves in that period for origin, and they have the depth to cover origin, and then come back and, as you guys said, have a real crack at the title. Reese Walsh back after that uh, fractured eye socket. And it was great to see him in open space and with the headgear on and still flashy and diving for that try. But is he, will he take a few weeks still to get back to his best after missing a couple of games? Oh, I think he's at the level now where you come straight he, back in. He comes and straight on. back in and he has that expectation, you know, about his performance. And I just mentioned the hammer and how dynamic he is and important he is to the Dolphins. We just saw Reese Walsh when he got the opportunity to open up and you know take that try off the loose ball and the offload. Like he is special as well. So there's no doubt when when you are missing some key personnel, the other the other important members of the team have to step up. And I think even if what Reese is in the, he's at the stage of his career, if he was to have three, four, five weeks out, it's like when he's back, he's back and he, he's ready to do his job. Uh, hopefully Reese is um, sort of mature enough now. And I know he's only 21 or 22 to understand like when he can have those games that he had last night and when he can't. And, and I think without Adam Reynolds there, you know, I think Adam Reynolds is a, is a really good um, um, teammate for Reese because I think he's a guy that can tell him to calm down, tell him how to play. He's looking the communication between those two is obviously usually pretty um, productive for Reese because last night it was just like he'd been let off the leash. He was excited to be out there. He just he was trying to, um, you know, make the big play probably too often, coming up with a few errors. And, and, and I know that you could kind of feel that they were going to get over the Dolphins at some point, but when you come up against better opposition, you just can't give them those opportunities. And I think there's some other fullbacks in the game where you talk about like, you know, the hammer, he doesn't make those sort of mistakes. And Kalen and those guys. So, yeah, I mean, he was a bit erratic last night, Reese Walsh. It's great to see him back out there. He was dynamic as, as ever. But there were parts of his game that I think that he'll sort of walk away and want to do better with next week. Hey, girls, I just wanted to ask you about the, the Dolphins, right? The situation with the coach, Wayne Bennett. We've seen now this whole succession plan. It hasn't really worked at South Sydney. It hasn't worked... Really, it didn't work at the Tigers hasn't really with Tim Sheens. Anywhere, has well, it? well, I'm getting to that point with now the Dolphins are going to move Wayne Bennett on at the end of the year. 
It seems yeah. to build it towards something. And I'm not taking anything away from Christian Wolf. He's obviously a very accomplished coach and he, he, might, he may do a good job, but it just seems yeah. as though you're putting a ceiling on what you can achieve and then you move on, especially when you compare it to what happened at the South. Like Wayne went to two prelims, a grand final, and then left because that was the contract that was agreed to. Do you think the Dolphins will end up in the same situation where they probably regret putting a, a time limit on what Wayne can do? I get the feeling, Chamo, that it's a, it's a year too early. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, that's the feeling that I get. And I don't know Christian, and I'm sure he's a fantastic coach and probably really looking forward to his opportunity. Um, I know they've got a really good group. You can just tell that they're, you know, they've got a, the way that Wayne's built that roster. They're, they're guys that, you know, you see him last night, like probably on the, on the, um, you know, when you have a look at the team sheet, you probably think, oh, they're going to get beat well tonight, but they find a way to compete. So I think he's got guys in there that like to play for the jersey, um, that he knows what sort of effort he's going to get out of. Not a lot of big personalities in there. So I think in that case, it's probably going to be a different situation than what happened when he left some of the other clubs. But still, if he's ready to coach and he doesn't want to go back and, and you know, sit on his farm in the, in the, uh, in the rocking chair... Well, then maybe the Dolphins, if it's okay with Christian, you know, consider another season. I mean, I guess it's going to come down to how uh, the, the new incoming coach feels about that whole situation. But Wayne's going to be coaching somewhere. Yeah. Can you see that happening? Christian Wolf no. saying, you know what, I'm happy to wait no. another year. It won't happen. Like He left the Super League to come back because that was the deal. It's in his contract. And Wayne knows that. I, I think if Wayne goes somewhere else, from what I gather, I'd be stunned if Wayne agrees to another succession plan. He's done it twice in a row now. He's done it at the... Yep. At South Sydney, and to be fair, didn't didn't need to leave. He left because he had a job at the Dolphins. But if he wanted to stay at the the Rabbitohs, he would have, and they were building towards a title. Same thing goes here. They put a a ceiling on what he can achieve by giving him a three year deal. One as a to get the club set up, and two as coach. And I think, as Gerd said, they're probably a year short, and he, he can continue to give that club more. And unfortunately, a contract won't allow that. Well, will he end up? At the Rabbitohs, he's been tossed up as one of the possible replacements for Jason Demetrio. So too, Mal Meninga, Craig Bellamy's name was even thrown in there. After the break, we will dive into the crisis at the Rabbitohs. We are rocking your Saturday here on Triple M and we're doing it all thanks to King G. You wear the crown. Yeah, welcome back to the Saturday Scrum. Doing it all thanks to King G Workwear. Emma Lawrence, Wade Graham, Michael Chamis and Ryan Girdler this Saturday afternoon. Hope you're enjoying listening wherever you are in the car or at home, but someone who hasn't really had the best week or the best season. Chammy, Jason Demetrio, seems each and every week there's a new drama. Things have come to a head this week. It seems he's gone. Where are we at right now? Is he sacked regardless or does it depend on the results over the next few weeks? Look, I, I think Jason Demetrio's time at the club is coming to an end. When that will be will largely hinge on how they perform tonight. I don't think they have to win. But what the club want to see is some sort of reaction from the players. What they want to see is the players are still playing for the coach. And if they don't get that, and if, if they get a similar performance to what they dished out against the Warriors the week earlier, then they'll get their answer. And I, I mentioned on here a couple of weeks ago, every time this, team's, this team has had their back against the wall, they haven't responded. Last year, Sam Burgess' situation, he walks out, season on the line against the Roosters, they failed to respond. Luttrell, earlier in the year, with the incident on Triple M, club, un, club in turmoil, the club thought they'd get a response from the players. They didn't. If this happens for a third time, it'll be the end of Jason Demetrio if they don't perform tonight. I spoke to Nick Pappas during the week, the, the South Sydney chairman. He was quite adamant that it was about what he sees from the players. It's about. It's not about wins or losses in this situation. It's about the way they react. And if they don't dig in and they don't perform, it'll be the end. Do you think the players have JD's back? Some, yeah. Some. I don't. I don't think all, no. I think he's got the backs of, I think Luttrell and, and Cody are, are big fans of, of Jason Demetrio. I think they all like him as a person. This isn't, this isn't a, we hate the coach situation, but there, once you start to lose as much as they have lost in the last you know, 12 months, then people start to think that, okay, why is that? Are people getting treated differently? And I, I made the point during the week in the Sydney Morning Herald, I, I referenced the, an anecdote around Alex Johnston. Now, in a team meeting after that win against the Bulldogs, they sat down and they handed out the nominees for the Jason Clark Award, which at the end of the year is a, an award for the coach, uh, for the player who you know, displays the typical toughness and resilience that Jason Clark had as a player. And the incident that they chose uh, against the Bulldogs was 
when Josh Adokar was tackled in the corner there, he was concussed, but they, they try saving tackle in the corner. And Demetrio then proceeded to write uh, Tane, uh, sorry, Isaiah Tass and Latrell Mitchell slash Latrell Mitchell on the whiteboard. And that's when Alex Johnston piped up. And Alex Johnston said, why are we celebrating Latrell in this situation where it was a, it, he he was charged for that incident. He was he could have been he could have been suspended, and in the end, if he is suspended, he's hurting the team. So we shouldn't be celebrating that. We should sure celebrate Isaiah Tass, but not Latrell Mitchell. Now Latrell wasn't in the room, but given the mum the, the rumors at that club and a lot of the talk around uh, Latrell Mitchell uh, getting special treatment from Jason Demetrio, it highlighted yeah the, I guess the the unpleasant feeling amongst some of those players that. Maybe what Sam Burgess was saying was correct, that they are feeling that way about the coach. Well, well two, two things for me right off the cuff as a player. The fact that you know what's been said in, in team meetings. Say, how the hell does that, you know like, that? If you know what's meeting, being said in team meeting, that's, that, that's, that's a flag for me straight away as, as, a, that's an issue. as a person. Well, I rang Jason Demetrio to tell him that I was going to write it and to make sure it was right. And to his credit, he didn't lie about it, but I could tell in his voice that he was stunned. That, not the wow. fact that it was... Not the fact of what happened, but the fact that it was getting out. It yeah, got that, out. That, that, that's, I mean, a, that's a team meeting. Yeah, that's a, that's a worry for me as as a player. Like, I would be filthy if yeah. I was in a team, and but that's happening and a lot it, at South Sydney at the yeah, moment. Though and that's driving it a happened last between, year. You know, current players. The other thing for me too is like, and I get it around the Sam Burgess comments that that people were being treated different, right? But listen, Sam Burgess would have been treated different his whole career because, yep. like it or not, in clubs. There's a, there's a hierarchy, right? There's mm -hmm. senior players, there's captains, mm -hmm. there's origin players, there's representative players. The one thing that Sam never failed to do was do the business on the field. Yeah. He, he, yep. Despite if, whatever, he, if he got preferential treatment off the field, he always did the business on the field for the club. So the club, you know, always had his back. And, and at the moment, the players, whether they're getting treated different or not, they're just not doing the business on the field. And that, that, that's what our game is about. It's about winning. It's about the results. It's highly competitive, and you have to get out there and, and get the wins. Well, that's for the your conversations coach. that the club had with Latrell Mitchell this week. They sat him down, and Latrell, to be fair, Latrell sat down with his advisors. I, I wrote the story that he sat down with with Matt Rose and Walk Wright, his agent, and they they actually said to him, "If you if you are done, if you want to quit the sport, then quit the sport. Like we've got you back. You don't have anything else to prove. Just quit hmm. if you're not happy." That, but he told yeah. them that he wants to keep going, boys. And then the club wanted to make sure hmm. they wanted reassurances. Because they've invested so heavily in him that they've had his back all these years, they've let him do whatever he wants in terms of supporting him, that he needs to start now narrowing his focus and supporting the club in return. And that's the assurance he's given him, given them. So time will tell if those words turn into actions. It's funny that you say he's got nothing to prove or that's what the club thinks, Chamo, because I get the feeling that every time Latrell takes the field, and it might it's probably happened, like he had that amazing run last year where he was, he was arguably the best player in the competition. And when he does that and he goes on those runs, he, he just plays with such joy and, and you can just see it in his face. You can see it in his whole persona. It lifts the team. And I don't know, this year it just feels to me like he's going out there with exactly what you said, like a point to prove, but not a point to prove in relation to how he plays, but like that he needs to be kind of like the man, like he needs to have a real presence. He needs to be really over physical. He needs to kind of almost try and bully the opposition and, I just don't know whether sometimes, and I don't know what's going on with Luttrell um, away from the game, but I know that he chooses a leadership role for his community and for his people. And I'd, I'd imagine that carries over into stuff that he does online. I'd imagine there's a lot of people coming at him for a lot of different reasons um, that I certainly don't agree with, but I would imagine he's fighting a few battles away from the footy field. And I think sometimes he has trouble, um, you know, differentiating what's happening away from the game and what he needs to bring to the game. And that sometimes is hard. And I don't know whether you ever, ever went through that way though, but sometimes in certain stages of your career, it's not all black and white. People out there sometimes think, oh, you, these guys are getting a million dollars. They just, they're robots. They just need to turn up. Well, it's just not that black and white. The fact that, you know, when he plays to his potential, he's definitely worth that sort of money. But, you know, him playing to his potential is made up of a lot of different things of what's happened in his personal life, the relationship he has with his coach and his playing group and so many different things, right? And it just feels like to me at the moment, like when he gets on the field, he's so he, he, he's playing with so much aggression and anger that I just don't think it's generated f through the game itself. I feel like it's coming from somewhere else. I think you're spot on, Gertz. Th and, and 
the people around him think that's spot on too because they said, why are you trying to be the tough guy? What, what, why are you playing angry? And I think that the more people have criticised Luttrell over the years, the more he's become, the more the mentality becomes stuff you, I'm not going to show you that I'm hurt, but he is hurt. And I think he's deeply yeah. hurt by a lot of these things that have been said. But his way of dealing with it though, Gerds, yeah. yep, is to go out there and, and be an even more aggressive, more macho yeah. guy. And, and that's when he oversteps the mark and he gets penalised, he gets suspended and, he, and in the end he costs his team. They want him to be vulnerable. They want him to be the real Latrell Mitchell with his teammates. You don't have to be this 10-foot tall bulletproof guy. You, you, what, you, mm. what we need from you is completely different to the guy that you think that you need to be. And if he yeah. keeps going down that path, well, he's going to keep finding himself in trouble, keep getting criticized, and unfortunately, keep reverting f- further and further into that hole that he finds himself in at the moment. Well, he did admit at the start of the year in some interviews that he did with Nine that he had conversations with close family and friends about potentially giving up, like friends and family had said, do you want to keep going? And this was in the off season. Yeah. And he'd said, no, I want to go out on my terms. So he doesn't, seems to not want to be pushed out yeah, because well, of what others are saying. And like, but it might get to a point eventually where well, if he's adamant and in these meetings, he's adamant that he wants to yeah. keep going. Well, well hopefully for the game's seems, sake, you want him to it stay. seems M, that he's got like these, these, I mean, if that's ha- what, if they're the conversations that are being had, Chamo. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a real positive. I think if he's, if he's in there and he's remorseful and, um, he, he regrets it and he's willing to have those conver- those tough conversations about it, what needs to change and how it needs to change. And they're not discussing the coach. Cause a lot of people just think it's a direct relationship between, you know, whether it's him and the coach, whether they're getting on, whether they're not getting on, whether they have, you know, they have too much uh, say in what's happening over there. I mean, if all those things can be sort of taken away from, you know, that, that one problem that is what South Sydney face at the moment and the other one, which is getting the best out of Luttrell, um, well, then hopefully they can get some sort of resolution and sooner rather than later. All right, let's talk about Jason Demetrio for a sec. He, You said the fact that the writing's on the wall for him, but I think there was a moment, uh, well, the press conference lasted only 27 seconds this week, and many believe that that really highlighted the fact that he's not handling the pressure. So let's take a listen. We've had a great week of training. Energy through the week's been outstanding. Have you been out of Hey, there's some new blokes coming in, you know, Jai Gray, Ty Ty Munro, David Mowali back. I'm excited by the energy they've brought. In terms of you personally, though? I'm really looking forward to the performance. Can't wait. The energy's through the roof. Looking forward to it. Do you believe you're coaching for your job on Saturday night? I believe I'm coaching for a great performance this week, and that's what we'll get. Thank you. That's it. So asking those questions was Zach Bailey from Nine, and they were fair questions. He wasn't – he didn't come out – hammering him straight away, just asked how he was feeling. And you would have thought, Wado, that he would just address it in some capacity because that's the reason that everyone's there. They're unfortunately not there to ask about the match itself. They are all there to ask. It's been the story (laughs) all week and he knows that. Yeah, I think um, it's it's clear he's he's feeling the pressure and and he's just trying to concentrate and turn the narrative on, to, on the game. And it really, I get it. I, I think at the start of my career, when I was being criticized or if I wasn't feeling, I had a great relationship with the, with the media at the time, I would probably distance myself. I'd try to put myself on a media ban or I would be abrupt and, you know, not, not talk about the points that they want to talk, talk about. But as, as I grew older and got more experienced and understood I just always found it to just be honest and transparent mm. because once you just address it, you could just went, yeah, I get it. I know I'm under pressure. It's the business we're in. We're not getting the results. And if, if it continues, then yes, my, my job will be on the line. That's that's every coach in the NRL. If you mm. don't win, you, you're always under pressure and you, you you might be, it might cost you your job. So yeah, I, I just think it, it would be better. And my, it's only my opinion, but just be honest up front. Tell everyone how you feel and, and get on with it. He's, he sat down, <laughs> we sat down together at the start of the season uh, in San Diego and he, he told me about how he spent some time with a sports psych in England, Gareth Southgate, the English uh, soccer coaches, sports psychologist and what he took from it and how it was going to implement, how he was going implement, to in, implement that into the way he handles his business. I don't think that was in the script though. That, that wasn't something that he would have been told to do. The club was shocked by it. I don't think he's done himself any favors whatsoever by acting the way out. I had, I had flashbacks to Darius Boyd back in 2009 or whatever it was at, at Cogra when that, that uh, press conference lasted a few seconds. But it just shows 
that he's not dealing with it really well. And I think the tipping point was the stuff around Mal Meninga in the, in, in the 24 hours before that. That would have been, for him, the final straw. All the talk around his job. But when he hears that people in the club or people associated with the club have lined up Mal Meninga and they're lining up coaches, I think that part of that was a bit of a stuff for you to the club as well. I think there are people around the club that he's starting to feel undermining him and trying to play it out through the media and play their agendas out. I think that was a stuff you to them as well. How genuine are the chances that Mal is going? So they've clearly obviously made, have they made contact with Mal? Well, I or they've just discussed the fact that In my conversations with Nick could... Pappas, the chairman, he said no one has the, no, the board haven't discussed it and no one has the authority to go and speak to Mal or anybody else that hasn't been discussed. Now, we know how this game works, guys. There are third parties, guys who think they're power brokers, guys who are power brokers, who then go out and start canvassing people around rugby league to see what their thoughts are. I can guarantee that conversation by many people has been had with Wayne Bennett over the last couple of weeks, probably the last six months, given the fact that uh, there's been pressure on Jason Demetria for a while. Do I think the South Sydney Rabbitohs rang Mal Meninga directly and said, we want you to coach if, if Jason Demetrio is moved on? No, I don't. But people in this game talk, people share their thoughts out loud and Jason Demetrio would know where there's smoke, there's fire. And in this situation, there's definitely plenty of fire. I got. I got to say, guys, I was a little bit surprised with the move to drop a, a guy like Damian Cook. Um, I, I thought he was one of the better players in their win against the Bulldogs a couple of weeks ago. I thought he started to find a little bit of form. There were some defensive lapses, I think, last week from him. Um, but given they were they were so um, well beaten and dominated through the middle third of the field, I mean, it's hard to to blame a guy that just continually gives his best, I would imagine, you know, on the training paddock way that you've played with him, how he prepares, and then going out in the field. He's a guy that I would imagine when you look around, especially when you're in a in a time like this, a situation like this, those sort of senior players that just give their all are the guys that I believe you need to, you know, pull yourself out of these situations. Wade, what did you make of that decision? Yeah, I, I think with Cookie, it's, you know, he, he probably hasn't been playing the best footy of his career, and, you know, it's hard when you in a team that, that is struggling for form. But I think he's more a victim of circumstance as much as a, a poor performance with, you know, they're already getting a forced change at fullback with Latrell being suspended. Uh, Ilias is out. So they've already on their, this well, the, the next best half. So you, you can't really drop the half or Cody. And there's a young guy, uh, is it Mamazoulis? Pete Mamazoulis. 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 Yeah, and and, and he's Mamazoulis. been playing, he's been playing for a while in reserve grade, playing well. So there is someone in behind Cookie who you can make the change to. Like the other key positions, they're yeah. really they're struggling with with suspension injuries already. So there had to be a change. I, I felt so you like you think it's a, more of a statement. There had to be a change. I, I feel like more he, so than trying to get yeah, a, a result I, from the change. Hundred percent. I feel like he felt like he had to make a change, and that was really the only one he could he could do because he's already been forced into other changes. Um. Round six in the NRL and another great three games to dissect. Last night, the Storm pulled off an epic comeback down at Amy Park, getting the job done 16 to 14 over the Bulldogs. Waiter, you almost feel sorry for the dogs, don't you? Like that they were that close. They were going to pull off a monumental upset. And so on so many occasions, they've come so close this season, but it's just that matter of turning that effort into a result. Yeah, I, I think with their performances, definitely if you're a, a Bulldogs fan, there's a lot of positives to take out of. You can tell they're trending in the right direction. Do I personally feel sorry for them that they're not winning? No. <laughs> like, oh, come on, mate. I, I had, I had some on. losing streaks in, in my career. I bet you no one felt sorry for me. So That's not about you, Wade. That's, but, uh, <laughs> or no one felt sorry for the Sharks. I felt sorry struggle. for you. No, you didn't, mate. Yeah, that's true. You, I did too, Wade. Um, but the puppy dog face. I think like that, Melbourne are a hard place to go, right? And, and the dogs, that they'll never probably – in the last few years, even be close to that sort of performance. And it come, it came down to the goal kicks in the end. Like, yes, we can say Melbourne are probably not flying as, as high as they can. And, you know, Cam Munster's obviously not 100%. He's doing the job and they've had some injuries. But you, you have to be happy with where the Bulldogs, their commitment to their performance, their commitment to their defence. They they're starting to find some points. Like Josh had a car, just showed his brilliance on the weekend. Just how good would it be to have that extra metre of speed good throughout our career? It's just, he's, oh, yeah. he's dynamite. Like, and Bronson yeah. Cherry and him together, that they, they look dangerous. So, yeah, I, I think it's, it's disappointing that they're not getting the results all go their way, but they're, they're definitely going in the right direction. 
Yeah, I, I definitely felt sorry for him yesterday. I called that game and <laughs> I, you know, the first half, yeah, they probably bought a little bit on themselves where they, I think they completed in high, high 50%. You can't go to Melbourne um, and try and execute a game plan where you're playing a side like the Storm who are in good touch, have had some some big kills already this year with wins over the Broncos, the Warriors and the Panthers and go out there and throw like a 60% completion rate at them. They're just going to dominate. And that's what Melbourne sort of did. Melbourne, as Wado said, they cert- they weren't in their groove. I, I think that there was a that little bit of a, oh, if we just turn up, go through the motion, we're going to get the job done here. You could see that was kind of their their mentality a little bit. Um, and the, the Bulldogs just invited him into their own area too often in that first half, and, and the storm with the players that we spoke about with Pappenhausen and, and obviously Munster and Hughes, um, you know, they, they, they put him to the sword. And then the second half was just a total turnaround for the Bulldogs. They came out, and what, what really impressed them uh, uh, me about them yesterday and was the fact that it's not easy to go to Melbourne and execute a game plan, especially when the game plan is to shift out of your own end. The conditions, you know, you obviously slippery conditions down there, a side that really press hard defensively. And they were really competent with their ball movement, even from their own half. And that just shows me that they're a side playing with a lot of confidence, a lot of belief, sticking to the game plan. Their back end of their sets isn't great at the moment. They need to find that short sort of... um, that guy that, you know, between the, the 40 metres and the try line of the opposition, they come up with those short kicks. They've got Matty Burton, who does a great job get, getting them out of trouble, but their short kicking game leaves a little bit to be desired. But there's certain little parts of their game when they clean up and they find the right play to come up and execute that, that, that those processes for them. Yeah, they're playing some good footy and really enjoyed that game. And um, I think the Doggies fans will be walking tall today. Do we think, Chammy, there's been a bit of talk for like since the season started, probably they've tried, they've recruited well. Yes. But do they need a a star number seven to take them to that next level? Oh, there's no doubt. And they know it as well. And they, they thought they had Jerome Luai. They, that was where they put all their eggs and they were hoping that Jerome would come. And I think they had, they felt as though they had some assurances that he was going to come before the, uh, the Tigers came in late with it, with a big offer. I think they're, they're, they're a genuine halfback away from being a top eight football team like they they just look like they're a little bit lost at times and and yeah with all due respect to Drew Hutchinson he's he's coming to the club to do a job he's probably brought in as a backup half in the hope that they could land someone but it hasn't happened for him what what has happened though and this is where Cameron Seraldo deserves credit he arrives year one at the club and realizes pretty quickly when the going gets tough he doesn't have the players who are going to stick by what he believes the systems he has in place but also stick by each other so he goes and cleans out the roster, tries to remove the poison in the in the playing group that he believes is prohibiting them from taking the next step and goes and buys what he can. And to be honest, there wasn't a lot out on the market. So everyone can give them grief about signing all these utilities. What he was signing was people with the right attitudes, people mm-hmm. who were going to buy into what he was doing. And they may not be the best players in their positions, but it can't going to come in and drive a standard. And you can see that's what happened, has happened over the first six weeks of the competition. The next step now, though, is to sprinkle that with the class. And getting that is proving harder for Phil Gould and Cameron Seraldo than they thought. They need a front rower. They need a halfback. Getting one of a high calibre, it's not easy. It's not easy at all, especially when some clubs are going all out paying overs to, to bring people to theirs. I'll tell they you who... 13 as well, I think. Sorry, wait. No, you're right. I was going to say they, who fans should be excited about is the way that kick is playing. It's almost like he missed yeah. so much footy last year and, and they really... You know, they, they didn't get to see the best out of him because of the injury. but it's, So it's almost, for me, it's like it's his first season at the club. Yeah. He was mm-hmm. dynamic last week um, against the Roosters in that first half. He was, a, he was a part of those shifts to the left last night, early out of yardage. So he, he is confident. And for me, until they get that front row or that half, I'll, I'll send him a whole attack around kick out. If he's fit and match fit and ready to go, he, he could be like almost a Joey Manu of the Bulldogs. Give him 20 carries. He's going to create momentum on that first one, go back to the middle, test test the ruck, and then just go back to that left edge. He's so powerful and dynamic. Until you can get the other areas that, that you think you're deficient in, just go to your strength. What do you – you think they need a, a solid 13, Gertz? Yeah, I, look, you saw what they did last night when um, – I, I thought they were a better side, obviously, last week when in that first half against the Roosters when they moved Kurt Mann to 13. It just allowed someone, um, you know, to dive right into the line. Matty Burton – um, and a Hutchinson, they're not players that like to go into the line and play out the back and, and offer op- opportunities for, you know, their centres and their fullback coming on the back of shape. 
So I just thought last week they put Kurt Mann there and he really did that for him. He sort of dove in deep to the line and then would pass directly out the back and that allowed Hutchinson and um, uh, Burton just to get a little bit wider and it, it activated some of those edge um, ball runners and they've got some good powerful ones. We saw that last night. Obviously Crichton's out there probably not being used as much at the moment as he could be. Bronson Cherry was exceptional yesterday. Um, and so last night, yeah, they, they man got injured. So I, they... Um, who did they put in there? They put, uh, um, they put a, 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 a Turpin, Jake Turpin came in. That's right. Yeah. So they, they started him at 13 looking for a similar result. Um, and he did an okay job and they moved Salmon out to that edge because they realized that he's probably not a guy to do that. So, um, you look at all the sides, all the sides that are doing well, they all have that 13 that can go in, dig into the line and give those halves, those options. So there's just a couple of players there short, but yeah, I agree with the boys. They're heading in the right direction. So let's not take anything away from the storm as well. They managed to get the job done. How good was Xavier Coates that uh, girds not only a couple of epic tackles on Connor Tracy, but that try assist as well when it looked like he was all wrapped up. There were four blokes around him and he somehow pulls off a kick for a storm try. Is there anything he can't do? He's in great touch, isn't he, at the moment? Yeah, no, that was just incredible. And that's what it came down to in the end. The Bulldogs, I thought, were the better team, but the the storm, when it counted, Jerome Hughes came up with a massive play, hadn't done a lot all night, comes up with a huge play, gets a quick play of the ball. That allows Munster to dig into the line, gives it to Bloor, scores the winning try. Pappenhausen had a couple of moments in the first half. Um, But they're, they're another side that I think they've won four out of five. They've got the bye. You know, beat some really good sides, as we've already spoken about. Probably, you know, that game last week against the the, um, Broncos, arguably the best game of the season. It was just so many brilliant attacking moments and parts of their game, obviously, that they need to build on. But I think they'd be really happy with where they are. And just finding ways to win when you're not the the best team on the night is just such a skill. And it's certain something that they've done probably two or three times already this year. On Caelan Ponga, you mentioned the fact that Billy, like, what's he going to do? I know it's early, but Gerds, yeah. like, you, you'd assume that number one jersey is Reese yeah. Walsh's. You want Caelan in there somewhere. Mm. Is Cameron Munster yeah. even going to be right with that groin? Could Caelan yeah. go in there? There are so many options, but yeah. do you want to have Caelan in there somewhere? Groin's hips. Yeah, it's you all happening. You've got to have Caelan in your 17. Oh, like, I mean, I hope they don't. I hope they leave him out, but I think he's probably <laughs> the most... <laughs> I think he's the most dangerous player in the game, you know, and he plays generally, you know, you, you, Reese Walsh, you know, has the benefit of playing behind the Broncos and, you know, with some talented guys around him. So, you know, generally you, you, you tip sheet against the Broncos, there's five or six players on it. Reese Walsh is always on the top of that list, but there's plenty of guys you need to look after when you come up against Brisbane and he's got the, the benefit of Payne Haas and Carrigan and the offloads and all those sorts of things. You need to remember that, you know, the, the Knights don't have that same sort of roster. So every team that goes out against Newcastle just has like Kalen first, second, third, fourth and fifth. <laughs> um, and so everything that he does and generally, you know, their pack, it's a solid pack. It's a working man's pack. And, you know, they have their weeks where they're dominant. They have their weeks where they're dominated. And regardless of what they do generally, he's always out there making a difference. So for mine... He'd be my fullback. Obviously, I'm not involved in Queensland selections. And my favourite player also is I love the hammer. You've got to have him in there as well. You know, you've got to have him in there somewhere. So you've got three. I mean, the fullbacks in our game at the moment is just insane amount of talent in, in that number one jersey for about eight or nine of our um, NRL clubs, which is so exciting to watch on a weekly basis. But, yeah, how you get those three guys into that side is going to be um, – a, a great, a, a great uh, thing for Billy to have to work out. Hey, guys, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think Kalen actually debuted off the bench, and the, and the question marks in Origin, yeah, he did. W- yeah, he did. Was where where were they going to the put middle. him? And he played in the middle, and he actually yeah, definitely he did a great job. So yeah, <laughs> it's a scary proposition uh, for New South yeah. Wales if they get him all in the squad, but we've got to back the Blues. Come on, come on the Blues. Come on the Blues. It's, it's never too early. Have to you start. seen Wado's hat? Oh, New, oh because hat. he went to the, um, the reunion, uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was Blues a, reunion yeah. during the free, week. Is that a freebie? Is it, Wait, uh, we where got were some you decent fullbacks of our own to, to, to you know, I think, I think um, Madge is going to have some headaches problems in that in that situation himself, isn't he, with the talent we have in the number one jersey as well. So I wasn't I wasn't excluding New South Wales in that, in that point because they're definitely going to be a tough call for Madge in that spot as well later on in the year. I know you spoke, probably mentioned it, uh, Wado, a couple of nights ago on the Thursday scrum, but 
Tell us about the reunion. How many uh, turned up and, and did you like the initiative from Madge? Yeah, I love this. It. My first opportunity to go to one of those um, reunions. I just finished, I retired last year, so I'm officially an old boy. And um, yeah, it was, it was good. Sterlo's talk about some great memories and some stories about his time and Benny Elias had a chat. And um, yeah, yeah, I loved it. It's, it's funny because... Like you, you talk about origin to me, like my favorite memory about origin growing up was Wednesday night. I got to sit up and watch the game with my dad, right? Friday night, yeah. you could watch the footy and stay up late because it was the weekend. You're fine. And you had a game the next day, but Wednesdays, it was a school night, right? So you go to bed mm. at eight o'clock, but mm. used to sit there with dad and, and watch origin and watch Gerds run around and watch all the greats run around. And as I grew up and started my footy journey, like that's what I wanted to do. And that's who I wanted to be. So to enter a room and to sit with all the legends, like uh, Brandy was there and Sterlo catching up. I sort of feel like uncomfortable being in their presence because I, I, I love them so much, but it was awesome to, to be there. Madge spoke about um, where his head's at and what he's thinking with the current squad moving forward. And yeah, it was, it was really nice. And um, for sure, if I get an opportunity to go to, to further things in the future, I'm going to go. What do you make of Madge, Wade? Like obviously it's, yeah, well documented what happened, him taking over Freddie. Is that style of coach going to be suited to origin? We know his, his reputation is as an intense coach. We know he's taking him to the Blue Mountains, locking him away. What's he going to be like as a coach, do you think, for this New South Wales team? Oh, well, I hope he's great. I hope he kills him. I, I want to back him. Like I said, I just spoke about how much I love the Blues, and I want to see him do well. And he's certainly got a clear idea of what he wants and, and what he expects out of, the, um, out of the players. And he wants to build... Um, build more around New South Wales and the meaning meaning of it to be a blue. And that, you know, it was a small step on the weekend having the true blue reunion. There's going to be more down the track. And yeah, I think he's doing a good job uh, in the interim trying to build us up and get us excited. And yeah, I hope he kills it. I, I wanted to ask you, there's a lot of talk at the New South Wales rugby league. And I'll bring Gerds into this because last year you were very critical of some of the things happening in, inside the New South Wales team. Do you, do you agree with this notion that is coming from the New South Wales rugby league that, Former players, New South Wales media, they should all be backing the Blues. Like this notion of being cheerleaders. Gerds, I think Gerds is well, respect, you know, well respected in the media industry for what he says, but he's also a diehard New South Wales fan. Finding that balance, though, do, do you think there is anything to say, anything to suggest what the New South Wales rugby blues, blues want from the media is out of line? You ask me or Gertz? Well, Gertz well, G- G- is the You're one right. who, who sort of felt yeah. the brunt of it last year. Um, oh, look, I think that, um, you know, like we're in the media. And so when th- all things are going well for New South Wales, I think that, um, you know, we're we're obviously speaking about the things that are that are um, going well at that, that time. And when things aren't going so well, we come on shows like this and people like you ask, Wade and I, what's wrong with the Blues? How can they do better? And, and then it's our job to, uh, you know, analyse and pull things apart and give our suggestions as to how it can be better. Not so that they change the team, just because that's what we think. And I, I know that the, the New South Wales Rugby League kind of um, think that all, all the Queensland old boys in the media look after Queensland. But if you remember a couple of years ago when we won those series um, and, you know, we were pulling them apart and I think three games were up here in Queensland and, and we won two of them and I'm not sure, I think the third one they got up, that you should have read the media up here. That's the same situation. So um, I, don't, I don't think there's, you know, it's possible for us to, if New South Wales aren't, you know, having success for us to just sit here and say, look, everything's good. It's okay. We'll be better and be positive. I don't, I think that's boring radio and that's not why we're, that's not why we're paid. So, um, I think we, we always take into consideration that we're old boys in New South Wales. And first and foremost, I know that my heart is always on my sleeve at that time of year and I really want them to do well, but at the same time I'm paid to do a job and, you know, I'll continue to do that.